Well, welcome to another Business Today show. Show 18. Last week, Andrew talked about how to be confident in yourself. Anne-Marie discussed the dealing with stress and Helia discussed how to motivate yourself. This week, Andrew talks about branding. Helia talks about the luck factor and Anne-Marie how to deal with anxiety. Well, welcome to another Business Today show and we have got an interesting show lined up for you. We're starting off with Helia Singh, Gerard. Uh, she's talking about luck. <laughs> um, and there was a famous golf player in South Africa, Gary Player. And he always said, the luckier, uh, sorry, the, the, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Yes. So. And, and Helia read a book recently, and I think it's by a, a gentleman called Wiseman, and it's called The Luck Factor, and how you can actually create your own luck. I, I think this is going to be a great way to start the show. It, it reminds me of that Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah. Do you feel lucky? <laughs> <laughs> I think this might just be a bit different, Gerard. <laughs> Here she is, Miss Helia Sink. Well, we're back in the studio with Helia Sink. How are you, Helia? I'm great, thanks, Michael. How are you? I'm very good. I absolutely love watching Wealth TV there on YouTube that you've got. And your latest episode I want to talk about, you've you reviewed a book or talked about your experience with a book, The Luck Factor with Richard Wiseman. That's right. And you yeah, you talked about how it taught you can actually change your luck. Oh, yes, exactly. Uh, I think um, everybody needs to read this book, honestly. I mean, th that's one of the best books I've ever read. And uh, I personally practice the, you know, all the uh, exercises in the book. And I have increased my luck for sure. And that's why I'm here today. <laughs> you made a comment on the show and it really resonated me is luck is how we interpret the event that's happened to us. I found that intriguing. Yes, it is. Thanks, Michael. It's true that when you look at yourself, I mean, when you talk to people, um, they, the way that they label themselves with the word, oh, I was lucky or unlucky, which actually most people, they use unlucky more than being lucky because uh, for some reason, people like to get credit for the good event in their life, but for the bad event, they just want to you know, blame it on other people and on luck. But when they talk to me and, uh, and I ask them and I make them to change, uh, see it in a different light, they said, yeah, yeah, I guess I can say that it was lucky too. And I, this simple technique, it shows that that's all in our brain, how we see things. Mm. It's, it's interesting, you know, people, I suppose, uh, go through things and at the time they may feel unlucky, but one of the, th you give a couple of examples where you look back and I suppose a few people can giggle and say, well, thank God I didn't marry that person or thank goodness I didn't get that job. <laughs> and, That's right. it's, and you talked about uh, reflecting in your gratitude journal. Is this one of the things you do? You reflect back on past events so you can reinterpret them in a more positive light? Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, because it's only through that reflection we will find out uh, how um, our journey of self-development is being traveling and also whether we are still stuck in those uh, mindset from 10 years ago. If somebody is out there and I still think that something that happened, uh, a bulliness happened at the school and I still think that was an unlucky event, you really need to work on that because even I was bullied very much because I, w I used to go to a richer schools and being a middle class just because my marks were good I went to that school and uh, but when you look back and say oh my god I mean that was just nothing and when you l compare yourself with the others who are in that school so I just see that look it's it's all about me I got myself to this level whatever they got it was their parents money but I managed to get to where I am that's fantastic I do love that so one of your recommendations or takeaway for today is you might have an interpretation of an event that happened in the past, but it's worth revisiting it now in your gratitude journal and changing that interpretation because then that will change your life moving forward. 
exactly exactly it's just this is how we create that vibration inside us because our brain doesn't know that that something happens is real happened or if it happens in our brain i'm sure everybody's had that experience that you know you had a dream and uh, in the dream you were basically like jumping off the cliff and you wake up and your heart is pounding and you just felt oh my god that was so real this is exactly how our brain works all the time so it just depends on what you're feeding it and it can experience the same way wow what a great segment there by hell yeah i love that when she's talking about luck i think you're the only person that can change your own luck mm. uh, when listening to to podcasts and listening to business shows for example like this show there's always something that you can take away but at the end of the day it's up to you to to implement it and change your luck so something will will yeah. happen and i think when she gave the strategies in on how to do it you know and, and we often talk on this show don't we you know when you're listening to shows like this and listening to people write stuff down and write those golden nuggets and just mm. choose one of them just choose one and implement the one that we the one percent factors exactly and the, the one strategy maybe to to use today with the show is to see what can you change improve create remove so if you listen to somebody like for example the luck see what in your business what do you need to change improve create and remove to make it better yeah and there's one person and he's coming up next andrew ford and he certainly does this all the time i mean 35 years in business and he's continually doing this methodology to improve, yep. well, he would call it luck, but it's no. certainly a strategy to guarantee his success, Gerard. Yep. And, and this week is about branding, mm. and we are so, so strong on, on branding because you are your brand, not only your business. So yes, here I he is, and Andrew Ford with branding. Okay, we're here with Andrew Ford, Ford and Doonan. How are you, Andrew? Well, Michael. <laughs> And we've had lots of discussions of, you know, over the time, listening to customers and so forth. One thing that strikes me, the success of Ford and Doonan, is how you've been able to combine branding with actual sales. And, and you yourself, I've heard you mention a few times, you do things from a branding perspective and not just purely trying to get the dollars off, off a customer. You want to educate a customer. Can you give people insights how Ford and Doonan have done that? Yeah, I think, I think it's changed in recent years compared to even 20 years ago when most advertising was a call to action type. You've got a special on or you've got excess stock or whatever that call to action may be. But now, especially in the electronic medium forms of TV and radio where we're bombarded with information like that, people aren't listening as intently as what they maybe used to do in, in previous years. So I think you have to be realistic about it. It's okay, as long as my brand gets into that person's head, when they go searching for a product or service of yours, they'll Google it like everybody does, and your name will come off the page in their head for, from recall of your brand. So, and then from that point, you then start the, the, the messaging of you know, what your product and service or specials or promotions you may have on. To try to do that in a mass media, I just don't think works any longer in the 21st century due to that information overload we all suffer from. Mm. One thing I've seen with Ford and Doonan's branding, I think we've talked about this as well before, is your consistency of colours, from fonts. I mean, I've dealt with Christian down there. I don't get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> why is that so important? Not just for Ford and Doonan, but why should it be so important for a business owner? I think, again, goes back to that um, recall in the client's mind, that if your colour scheme, in our case, is blue, um, if suddenly next year it was red, and it's a press ad or some other sort of form medium, it may not resonate with them. That's even our advert. Mm. So to change colours too often, I think, obviously sometimes we all go through a brand change, but I think definitely limit them and stick to it. And the style guide, it was our previous marketing manager at Ford and Christine, who did a doctorate in marketing before she joined us, and she used to bang on about consistency, consistency. So she really tightened up our, um, our marketing department. So we, yeah. we all preach that same message now. There is something about your branding as well. You, you obviously want to get a message through to the consumers. And one thing that does strike me with Ford and Doonan is your famous song. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Have a Ford and Doonan day. Yes. For business owners, sometimes they struggle with what can they say to somebody. But have a Ford and Doonan day has a lot of meaning to the mm. actual company itself, doesn't it? It does, and that was the beauty of it when the agency came up with it. And the first time we heard it, we were just, yep, that's it. 
Um, you hear some really corny jingles, but we're really, really happy with it. And that is the beauty of that one. It can be melded into so many different. Um, and one promotional video we did, we actually went into our clients um, to our builders and asked their staff of the builder, what's have a Ford and Hyundai mean to you? And the responses were all different, but it all sort of joined together and weaved together into the similar sort of undertone. So, and that was a beauty of our particular one anyway. Mm. From your perspective, and I do want people to hear this one, Ford and Dune and Dane, what is it you and Kyle are trying to tell people with that message? Yeah, because we didn't actually come up with it, I guess it wasn't, didn't originate from us, so it didn't, you know, hasn't got a, an under, underlying message as such. But again, we asked ourselves that in, in, in the production of this video. And to me, it's just reassurance of have a Ford and Dune and Dane that you get home on a hot day and the air conditioner is going to work. If it doesn't work, we're going to be there to fix it. Um, and just reliability of service, consistency of service, it just takes the headaches away. And that's what I think every business has to do, look at is take the pain away from the client. Don't make it any harder than what it already is. They're already in a state of angst, whether they're buying something, repairing something, whatever it is. You have to take away that, that concern that they've got to make it an enjoyable experience and make sure there's none of that buyer's remorse. Did I pay too much? Did I go to the right company? Mm. So overcoming all those objections throughout the wholesale process before and after, I think is critically important. And that goes back to they have a Ford and Dune and Day too to make them relax that I've made the right choice. Yeah, so for business owners, I mean, you've been very, very successful with it. Um, so business owners, you, you're attributing that now success in that if people are trying to tell a customer something, from your perspective is take away fears, concerns, doubts, and really your message is to give them confidence. Absolutely, I think that's critical. And the higher ticket the item is that you're purchasing or a service you're buying, the more critical it is that we get this buyer's remorse or buyer concern before we actually bought, that are we making the right decision? Should I be doing this at all? Um, so if you can overcome all those, they're all little steps or roadblocks in the sale process, that if you slowly get rid of them all, the customer can't but en say anything but yes, let's go ahead and be happy and tell their friends afterwards. Goodness me, 35 years, I've got to ask you one question. How come you're still so passionate? <laughs> business, I think I'm passionate about, just generally speaking. I love the challenge as well of business. And that's why I always like thinking laterally of what we're doing next and bring a new product or service. And not all of them work, you know, but that's fine to you have to accept some won't be as successful as others. But it, it fuels my passion for the business by bringing a new product and writing all the, the marketing material for it and content. That's what, yeah, I love it. Yeah, you absolutely do. And the Ford and Dune and customers are certainly benefiting from it. I can certainly say that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks, Michael. Well, Andrew, he is full of, well, just absolute knowledge. Look, this self-made, him and Kyle, they know what works. So I think when you listen to someone who's already been there and yeah. done it, you're getting practical advice, things that work, not things out of a book, Gerard. Exactly, and always, why, don't you, why do you want to make the mistakes yourself? Listen to other people and mm. implement so you don't make the same mistakes because mistakes cost you time and cost you money. Absolutely, absolutely, that was Andrew Ford. Now, another person, and we're talking about luck and how you can change your luck, and obviously with branding, the more you're doing that, you're kind of creating your own luck. It's like you said, the Gary player. The, yep. The more you practice, the luckier you get. <laughs> <laughs> but I know one thing, as we're doing these things, people can suffer anxiety. And it become, it's becoming more and more prevalent. Especially there's, there's a few things for me that happens. Let's take COVID out of this, the, mm. the, the, the picture here. But every time we change, we feel uncertain about certain things and then anxiety, especially when you start to to take your business to the next level because you know you, you might need to get loans, new mm. staff, you yeah. don't know if things are going to work and then anxiety sets in and that might just stop you from making the best decision of your life. Absolutely. So we went across again with a thanks to <laughs> technology. I think we got it working this week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did. We did a pre-recording with Anne-Marie in South Africa and she's actually talking about how to deal with anxiety. Well, we're back in the South Africa with Anne Marie. How are you, Anne Marie? Good morning. I'm very well, thanks. And you, Michael? Going really, really good. Now, fascinating topic. Uh, we, we start off smiling, but the topic I think is, is quite an unusual one, or maybe a misunderstood topic, and it is the one around anxiety. 
Yo, yo, Michael, I'm, I must tell you that in my recent sort of interaction with people and whether it was personally or whether it was professionally, the one topic that keeps on surfacing is anxiety. Um, people remark that initially they, they were okay, they felt okay, but now um, their levels of anxiety are much higher and they, you're quite right, they don't understand why now. Mm. If we, we hear a lot in the workplace, people talk about stress, they talk about depression, and then they talk about anxiety. But anxiety and depression are kind of two different things. Is that my correct understanding on that? Yeah, look, um, I'm, I'm not claiming to be a psychologist, so I just want to be clear on that. But anxiety is just this constant, uh, you know, um, more heightened senses, you know, higher heartbeat. You can't seem to quell your fears. You're just constantly in a space of protecting yourself. And, and it's as if something is going to happen, but nothing is happening. Um, you're just constantly sort of waiting for something to happen, but you don't know what it is. Mm. Uh, for people with anxiety, and, and it seems to be coming, I think people are starting to get more aware that they're actually got it, and other people are becoming a bit more aware that other people have got anxiety. Where, why does it challenge us in our daily lives? What are the issues around anxiety and the effects it's having on people at the moment? Sure, I, I think for one, um, Michael, the fact that you are in a place in your brain that's called the limbic part of your brain, so you literally, your, your body, your brain is warning you and protecting you, and therefore it secretes cortisol and adrenaline. Um, when you're there, you tend to either defend or you attack, um, and, and you're literally slightly less intelligent when you're there. So you are not your best. Um, in, intellectually, you're not your best. It is very different to adjust to change in that state. It is very different to just focus on your normal everyday work. Um, very different in interactions, in relationships, to just stay calm and understand what the other person is saying without feeling the need to either defend or attack. So I think it's just so, it's everywhere, in everything that you do, if you are anxious, it surfaces in absolutely every small little thing. Are there common triggers for anxiety in, uh, in, in the modern place, or are there different triggers for different people? And can people start to recognize the triggers uh, that causes their particular anxiety? Mm. Look, I think it, it looks different for, for every person, um, but that there are certain triggers, and I think it's really important that one starts noticing it and maybe even start journaling it. Um, in my conversations, my recent conversations, it was very clear, and it was so interesting what surfaced, is they always said, you know, that saying the only certain thing is, is death and taxes. Um, and in this... Um, time that we're living in, we all are facing death um, with regards to our own safety, whether it is people that we know or whether it is friends. So we, we confront it with death um, or the possibility thereof and taxes, our, our, our finances, all our, you know, I think there's very few people whose finances um, has not been affected through this. So I think this is the base load um, that, that you enter into a day that causes a lot of anxiety. And then there's the other stuff as well. Uncertainty, maybe at work, or maybe you're really adjusting very difficult in this time. So all these other things just sort of builds onto this base load of anxiety. So we've got all these symptoms coming in and adding to the base load that we've got in our anxiety that, that's, that's causing these things. Are there simple steps we can take to move us to a more, uh, a more, more comfortable place, shall I say, or a less anxious place? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Michael. Um, someone um, long ago um, shared a, a technique with me, a um, very special person, and he said SOS. So this is so simple to remember. It's stop, observe, and strategize. So stop your thinking. As soon as you realize um, you, you're feeling a bit anxious, stop your thinking. Observe and, and label it. Um, as soon as you label it, you move to a different part of the brain and already then you have more control and then you strategize, you know, what are you going to do about this, this angst? Where is it coming from? And, and have a plan so that you can get closure about it in your brain and in your mind and you don't have to sort of drag this with you every moment of every day. So have a strategy, address it so that you can that you can move through it. I'm, I know that I'm oversimplifying, it's not always that simple. So if you're clinically anxious, um, this technique I think would help, but it's definitely not the only answer. I think it's some great advice there and people who have got anxiety at levels that can be clinical and obviously a, a, a health professional, but this is certainly a very simple strategy to help people get going and maybe put them back on a path so they at least start to take some control like that. So SOS, stop, observe and strategize. Anne-Marie, it has been wonderful having a quick chat to you once again. Thank you so much, Michael. I must admit, talking to Anne-Marie Gerard, absolutely sensational. She really does have her finger on the pulse and is really, she's really able to help people in, the, in those areas. I always take something away from her every time I speak to her. Mm. Now, the other part that's become a regular favourite on the show is Gerard's 60 second question where he asks people, successful people, uh, a question and they've got to answer it in 60 seconds. It reminds me of our one minute millionaire. Minute. We get a millionaire strategy in 60 seconds. Well, here's your, here's your chance to hear from people who've been there, done that, and how they think. Gerard? You put them under the pressure, no warnings. No warnings. So the question is, you have to look after yourself to look after other people. What do you do to look after yourself? Well, this lesson in life, I came to learn it very late, but of course it's never late. It's, too, it's never too late to learn something new. But by finding what I love to do and how to take care of myself, it just helped my family and everybody around me. And what I do about it is just having me time. And that me time can be just reading a couple of uh, pages of uh, poetry or listening to my favorite music or even smell my perfumes collections. Whatever that makes me feel good that day, that's how I take care of myself. To look after myself, I try to make sure that I eat properly. I try to get rest, which is not always that easy. Um, and exercise. Exercise really does play a big part of me. Uh, for, for me, getting to go to the gym again is going to be a wonderful bonus. But yeah, you need to look after yourself physically and emotionally. Fortunately, I have a couple of dogs. I walk them. I love playing with them. They, they keep me young. I go to the gym every day. <laughs> so I train at least yeah, 30 to 45 minutes a day. Um, and I find that really balances both me physically and mentally. I find it clears my head before I go home at the end of the day. So I don't bring any baggage in and dump it on my family. Um, and physically, needless to say, it's a good thing. So it keeps your weight off, it keeps you healthy. So two benefits. Oh, I love those questions, Gerard. <laughs> well, well for, for me, is, I, I know we have to do, we practice what we preach. Mm. Uh, so for me, it's is, is, is just the running and the exercises. It just opens my mind. And that, that time I'm out there, that's the time for me. Not yeah. about the business or family or friends, it's about me. Mm. And that's look, looking after myself. Yeah, you know, no. I'm, I'm an artist, so I do painting, and that, that's my escape as well. If I'm not flying a plane, I'm painting okay. a picture. And then, of course, Michael, after he finishes painting, you have to send it to me for, for, <laughs> you know, for advice and uh, what do I think about it? <laughs> always nice, always oh, nice. Oh, always, <laughs> always encouraging, yeah. yeah. So open up your gallery in 20 or 30 years. <laughs> but we, it's been an absolutely fantastic show, but we, we've been going out and about. And this week we're bringing you two great guys, Dean Evans and Aris Vitilia, and ex-Perth Glory Pairs, so people in Perth, you'll recognize these guys, started their own business after sport, which is called the Football Center. 
it was terrific taking the cameras out there. I think it's important to, I mean, when you're in sports, what do you do after? Mm. And this is a great segment where what did they do after sports and how you can make it successful. And just listen to the gold nuggets in this oh, interview. And if you watch this at the end, Reese gives an absolutely classic piece of advice to all of us who really want to be successful in business. So this week, we're going to end the show with Dean and Reese and the Football Centre. And with that, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. You know, I'm having a look around this space here. Can you just tell the viewers how big a space you've got in here and how long it actually took you to set this, this up? It's around 915 square metres from memory, um, but the pitch is roughly 20 by 30 metres. So it's a pretty normal indoor size field. Um, yeah. It's got Astro, um, top of the range Astro turf that we, we've laid down here and it allows players to wear their outdoor boots inside, which is one of the unique things about the place. Um, and what wow. we find a lot, of, a lot of people coming in really love doing. And it probably took, what, close to nine months setting up? Yeah, all up. All I mean, up. a lot of council, things and, and loop hoops we had to jump through there. Um, the nets getting installed. Yeah, um, but I mean, apart from that, after the council approval was done and laying the turf and the nets, it, everything was pretty pretty smooth sailing, yeah. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. And have you found the support of council now you're open? Do they, have they been inspected or are they supportive or is it just, yeah, just get on with business? I mean, after, after we put our planning application through, they sent mm. someone out to check that it's all yeah. It's all legit and it's all there and that's been done and ever since then, yeah, we've, we've had no problems whatsoever. What do you find the response of the parents have been coming and having an indoor soccer field? Are you finding parents are actually loving the security aspect that the, the kids can't just run off and escape across roads and things like that? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, look, being indoors, you're, you're taking away the, the sun factor as well, you know, especially hot days like today. Don't have to worry about kids getting burned rainy weather you know we've got again this place is there's just no excuses yeah. um, in terms of weather and safety as well you know obviously there's cars driving in and out but we've got the net mm. once they're in here they're in here they're safe there and you know and it's good that parents are you know they're happy to leave their kids with us and trust us and yeah it's, it's a good thing it's a controlled yeah. environment yeah which, yeah. Is, which is nice now i've got to ask you too which i'm sure lots of people can ask you you're both competitive soccer players you still play yeah. How does that work in a business relationship? Who wins? It, it's fun in a business relationship, I guess, <laughs> until the week we play each other. And <laughs> then, uh, then, it gets a little, then we don't speak that week. Yeah. But that, that's fine. No, it's, it's, still, it's still good. We, you know, mm. Football is one thing we've always said. Once you cross the white line, you've got your, you've got your game face on. You, you want to play. Mm. You want to win for your team. But once, once the game's over, you, you chill mm. out and you're mates again. You know, and that's how football should be played. Do you think coming from a team sport, and both of you are playing competitive team sport, it's helped you in business to cooperate as a team? That when you come in, you can sort things out pretty smoothly amongst yourselves? Yeah, I think so. I think we've both got the, the same drive and determination, the same ideas. Um, having a similar background, having known Reese for over 10 years, it's, it's pretty easy, to be honest, because, yeah. you know, we've, like I said, we've got the same ideas. We bounce off each other and you know, we want to grow the business, but we're having fun doing so. Reese, going into business, one like this, what do you think some of your learnings have been along the along the way? I did ask <laughs> Dean at the uh, when he's in the studio, but yourself, what's it been um, like? Everything, everything's brand new for us. I mean, running a business is something we've both never done. Um, so everything from the idea and getting things up, each step has been a new learning curve for us. Um, but it's been a really, really enjoyable one. And when it's something that we've created and we've thought of and it's something a little bit different, it, it's special. Um, mm -hmm. And when you see kids come in here and leave with a smile on their face, you know everything, all the hard work they've put in prior is all worth it. Now, Dean mentioned in the studio you guys have got some secret plans for expansion and he wouldn't tell me what they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big thing, they're secrets. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can't lay it all out right no, now, you know what I mean? I mean, we'd love to expand one day, but um, yeah. at, for the time being, we're based here in Osborne Park, and um, I think that's where we'll be for, yeah. for the foreseeable future. Yeah. One thing we were talking about was the number of, you know, real high-class players that still come and see you guys to, to train and to practice. That must be 
real kudos to yourself for the quality of the establishments you've set up, but also the the uh, quality of you two guys in general for them to want to come here and train with you. Yeah, no, of course, like I said, we, we built great relationships uh, when we were playing and met some great people as well. And that, that's the best thing about football. You're meeting new people all the time. And mm. and of course, you like I said, you're building, you're building good relationships. And if you can stay in touch and especially now that we've got this, we, we want to help them too. So, yeah. you know, that's that's why I'll be bringing them here. And it's, it's kudos to them as well. You know, they're, we're working with top, top athletes here, pros, and they still want to get better. And they're phone calling us saying, can I come in and do sessions? And yeah. that's always a it's nice thing. And, and they're always welcome, always welcome. Do you find that's a hallmark of a top athlete? They just always want to get better? They're definitely, not satisfied? Definitely, I mean, they're never satisfied. And you look at any of the top athletes, no matter what sport, they always are driven and they want to get better. You yeah. look at Ronaldo, still at the yeah. top level, still scoring over 30 goals a year, but that's because he's got the drive and, and the love for it still. Yeah. You know, he wants to keep getting better. And it's a great message to all young players that we work with as well. Mm. I mean, probably the hardest working player we've ever coached in here is Josh Risden. Yep. I don't know far. if you agree with that. By far. You went to a World Cup with the Socceroos, but you can see why. And you can see the difference from his level to the rest that we've worked with. Yeah, wow. For someone going into business, Reese, what would you say? Any words of advice? I mean, there's a lot of fear in uh, setting up your own business, I guess, and a lot of setbacks, and a lot of people will tell you that you can't do it. Um, but if you believe in yourself and you believe in your idea, go for it. Work hard and I promise things will come up.